Where's level two? What's the point of level he one will without never level, do level two? two? Does he know what Is number he comes stupid? after one? I think he smells. <gasps> level two. Let's talk about rhythm. But before we get into level two, we need to talk about level one. If you haven't watched level one, you need to master that before you watch this video. If you're new here, the thesis behind this series is I've laid out a roadmap of concepts that you should learn on guitar in order, and I'm teaching it level by level. I'm not here to offer quick fixes or any kind of hacks or any promises that if you just click on my video, you'll be a better guitar player instantly. I'm here to try to help cut out a lot of the noise and show you how this instrument works under the hood. So if you've got level one down cold, then let's get into level two. Starting with how do we measure music? So back when you were just another of the unwashed, non-guitar playing masses, you probably thought that music was measured in minutes and seconds. Now that you're a guitar playing, face melting deity, it's time to learn that music is split up into standard units called measures. Here's what a measure looks like. Measures are sometimes called bars, and they're little chunks of music that usually have four beats. Speaking of four beats, let's revisit that basic four count I mentioned earlier. This is what's called a time signature, and as contemporary guitarists, we don't see these very much because we don't read music off a page very often. The top number here tells you how many beats are in a measure, in this case four, and the bottom note indicates which note gets the beat. In this case, it says four, which means a quarter note. Four and a quarter kind of makes sense. You can see how they're related. This is called a 4-4 time signature or a common time signature, and this is the most common one you see. As a quick note, there are other time signatures, but for now we're just focusing on 4-4 time. So I said that in 4-4 time, the quarter note gets the beat, but what is a quarter note? This is a quarter note. When you think of the regular standard music note, you're probably thinking of a quarter note. In 4-4 time, there are four quarter notes in a measure. Which kind of makes sense. Like I said before, 4-4 time means that there's four beats in the measure and the quarter note gets the beat. But how do you count quarter notes? Luckily, this one is easy. Quarter notes are properly counted by saying and thinking one, two, three, four. So quarter notes are the most basic fundamental kind of note, and four four time is the most basic fundamental kind of time signature. But what if you want to play a little faster? If you want to play a little faster, you got to scrap all of that and use what's called eighth notes. Eighth notes look just like quarter notes, except they have this little flag here. And as you might guess based on the name, an eighth note is just a quarter note cut in half. So instead of having four quarter notes in a measure, you're going to have eight eighth notes. And just so you know, this little bar across the top is just something that you have to put when you put two eighth notes together. It doesn't really make sense, but these are the rules of music after all. They have no obligation to make sense to anybody. But our next problem is how do you count eighth notes? Unlike quarter notes, you can't just count them one, two, three, four. After all, you have double the amount of notes you had when you had quarter notes. In order to verbally count eighth notes, we have to add an extra syllable. And for some reason in music, we add this. This little plus means and. So to make sure that our whole numbers still line up on the beat, the numbers always go on the first of every other eighth note, and these little ands go in between. So if we were going to count this verbally, it would be one and, two and, three and, four and. So that gives us enough syllables, and if you're ever writing it down, enough symbols to match eight notes in a measure instead of four. So again, eighth notes are counted one and two and three and four and. But what if you're the next Steve Vai and even eighth notes aren't enough? In that case, we have to divide the notes again in order to create sixteenth notes. This is what a sixteenth note looks like. It looks pretty similar to an eighth note, except it has two flags instead of just one. As the name suggests, there are sixteen sixteenth notes in one measure. I do want to jump in here and mention that as guitar players, unless you're playing classical or you're trying to get into jazz school or playing jazz combos or something, we don't really have to know how to read this music. So it definitely doesn't hurt to learn to read music, just don't get bogged down in the intricacies of standard notation here. I know that I've used a lot of notation in this section of the video. It's just that this stuff is hard to teach and to learn without a visual aid, so if I'm going to use a visual component anyway, I might as well use the correct format. 
So to be clear, the point of this section is to not teach you how to read notation. It is to teach you different note values, and I'm just using a visual aid to do that. Anyway, moving on. So just to recap, on the top here are quarter notes. There's four of these in a measure. In the second row here are eighth notes. There's eight of these in a measure. Sixteenth notes are on the third row here, and again, there's 16 of these per measure. Quarter notes don't have any bars across the top. None of these notes are connected because they all stand as one beat all on their own. Eighth notes have to be connected across the top with that little bar that I mentioned earlier in order to create one beat. There's two of these per beat, so it makes sense that we would group two of them together with this little bar to create one beat. Because sixteenth notes are an even further subdivision, we denote them with two bars across the top. Sixteenth notes are so short that they have to be grouped together in groups of four in order to create the same beat, the same length of time, as a quarter note. So how do you count them? So when we counted quarter notes, it was simple. When our quarter notes turned into eighth notes, we added a symbol slash syllable, which was and. So it would follow that for sixteenth notes, we're going to need to add some syllables again. I bet you're wondering what random noises we're going to use this time. In order to show you how to count 16th notes, I made this magnified little group of 16th notes. Again, this is just one beat. You can see that this is just one of these four little guys. It's just bigger, so I can show you how the numbers work on this. For some reason that science isn't quite sure yet of, the music gods have chosen that E and A will be our new syllables. So if we go to our zoomed in one beat worth of 16th notes here, this is going to be counted one E and a. Uh. That's how it's written. That's how you say it. One E and a. Uh. And remember on each beat the number changes. Let me show you what counting a whole measure would look like. So in the first beat it would be one E and a. Uh. But for the second beat we would just swap out two. So it would be two E and a. Uh. For the third beat, it would be three, three E and a, uh, and so on. So to count a whole measure of sixteenth notes, it would be one E and a, uh, two E and a, uh, three E and a, uh, four E and a. Uh. You can see that no matter what kind of note value we're using, the one always happens in the same spot. The and always happens in the same spot. The E and the A will always happen in the same spot. So there you go. That's pretty much as small as we chop up our notes. Now just so you know, there are such things as 32nd and even 64th notes, but these are so rare they're not even worth teaching and they're usually treated like, uh, they're called grace notes, uh, which are kind of like stylistic noises more than they are full-fledged notes. They're so rare and so sparsely used that I don't even know a widely accepted way of counting them. Maybe some classical players can roast me in the comments and tell me that I'm wrong and there is a standard way of counting them, but either way, in contemporary guitar it's so rare that I haven't encountered it. But what if instead of getting faster, you kind of want to go the other direction and get slower? In that case, you need a half note. Slower notes are pretty simple, so I don't think I have to go into too much depth to explain that half notes are worth two beats, and so there's two of them in a measure, and if I were to count two of them in a measure, it would look like this. One, two, three, four. As you can see, half notes look like quarter notes, except for half notes are hollow. And the slowest of all notes is a whole note, which is worth a whole measure. You count four beats to count a whole note. And it has no stem at all. They kind of look like a whole. Okay, so we covered what a measure is, what are the different kind of notes you can play, and how to count them verbally. So the question is, how do we apply this to guitar playing, and why is a theoretical deep dive into rhythm the next spot on the guitar roadmap? So the answer to that question has two parts. The first part is pretty broad, and basically it says that in music, you know, everything we do is involved with rhythm somehow. Rhythm touches every single part of music, and one of the biggest differentiators between a beginner guitar player and a more advanced player is having good rhythm. The second and more pointed answer to that question is that rhythm can really help with strumming. So by this point in your guitar playing journey, you've probably discovered that strumming isn't as simple or as easy as it looks. And in level one, you know, we talked about how to hold the pick, how to move your hand and your arm in order to strum properly, just to kind of get the basic mechanics of strumming going on. But in order to go from practicing basic mechanics to actually playing music, we have to be able to apply rhythm to strumming. So if you're on my channel, I can guess that you've probably looked at other YouTube videos that describe strumming patterns in terms of up and down. They might say something like, you know, the strumming pattern of this song is down, up, down, down, up, down, or something like that. They use those words, down and up. So instead of using downs and ups in order to verbalize music and kind of get into strumming patterns, I want to start using the technical music jargon that we just talked about. 
I'm gonna go ahead and name this topic strumming but harder. Strumming but harder is built on two main pillars. One of those is hand movement and the other is counting. Let's talk about hand movement first. So the idea is that when you're strumming, your hand should be constantly moving, even if there's a rest in the strumming pattern. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say there's a strumming pattern. Let's pick something kind of simple. Down, up, down, down, up, down. I'm gonna keep my hand moving the whole time and the strumming pattern is gonna be created only when I choose to make contact with the strings. So check this out. So I'm gonna get my hand going. As you can see, you know, I'm not making contact with the strings, but my arm is going, I'm ready to strum. I'm just gonna use an open G chord just because it's simple to hold. The pattern is down, up, down, down, up, down. Remember, I'm keeping my hand moving constantly. It should look like this. What you'll notice there is that in the middle of that pattern, there was a rest, it was an up strum, and my arm kept moving, okay? I didn't take my arm away from the guitar, I didn't simply reset, I just kept my arm going, and the strumming pattern was created when I chose to make contact, in this case, on the pattern down, up, down, down, up, down. Let me give you another way to think about this. When we build a strumming pattern, we'll start with the basic, most simplest strumming pattern we possibly can. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. In order to create other strumming patterns, we're just gonna take our hand away sometimes so as to not play you know, every single pass. So all strumming patterns are just created from that basic strumming pattern, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and we just remove certain passes. So if I just wanted to play down, up, and then rest for a beat, and then down, up, it would look like this. See how my arm kept going? So that's pretty much the basics of hand movement. You know, continuous hand movement is really important when it comes to having good strumming. The other pillar of great strumming is counting. And the reason I mentioned hand movement first is because you're gonna learn to count with your hands as you play. Let me tell you what I mean. So a really great tip on having good rhythm is to move as many parts of your body as you can in beat with the music so that you have a lot of different avenues to stay on beat. So obviously there's a couple of really known ones, you know, bobbing your head, tapping your foot, that kind of thing. But a great one for guitar players is moving your hand, right? Now the reason we do this is because, you know, we wanna be able to count in our head, but when we're performing, it can be really difficult to keep up with numbers and ands and e's and a's and everything in our head. So we wanna have other parts of our body moving so that we can kind of sit back and focus on other things besides timing while we're performing. We're gonna make a key shift here, and that's going from using down up terminology into using eighth note terminology. So if you'll remember, eighth notes are counted one and two and three and four and. In order to get away from using down up terminology, just know that the number, you know, the beat goes on down and the and is on up. So instead of down up, down up, down up, down up, you can use one and two and three and four and. If you just think of up strums as ands and down strums as the beat, then you're golden. So this is where constant hand movement becomes a way to track your eighth notes. We can think of strumming patterns this way too. I'm gonna use a different strumming pattern this time. Let's use down, down, up, up, down, up, or one, two, and, and four, and. It's the same thing, we're using this one because it's a super common strumming pattern, but for you to practice this, you can practice any strumming pattern you want. I'm just using this one because it demonstrates the point really well. So again, instead of thinking down, down, up, up, down, up, I'm gonna think one, two, and, and four, and. That is the secret to great strumming. It's constant hand movement, using your right hand to kind of count the eighth notes for you, and thinking of strumming patterns in terms of eighth notes rather than ups and downs. The way I would practice this is just pick any random strumming pattern you encounter and try to fit it into that framework of eighth notes. Make sure to keep that right hand moving and you're good. Now before I close out this video, if you've been paying attention to the guitar roadmap, you know that there's a couple other things in level two. Namely, learning the seven essential open chords and getting about five songs under your belt before you move on to level three. In an effort to make this video not ridiculously long, I have videos on those topics already. So you can check out seven essential open chords and five song recommendations for this level right here. And again, I wanna reiterate that you need to master everything in this video, everything in this video, and everything in this video before you move on. But when you're ready to move on, I'll be waiting for you in the land of nocturnal sunglasses. See you in level three.